Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, I know some folks are still trickling in, but I want to welcome you, and especially in these um, challenging times. And um, I want to invite our guest, let me pin him onto camera, uh, Ben Lorber. And, you know, I could, you've all probably read his uh, bio, and I could sort of repeat that and say that uh, I know Ben from when he did campus organizing for Jewish Voice for Peace. But uh, what I really want to do is let Ben uh, introduce himself, and if you could talk about uh, what you do and why you do it. And then I know you're going to give a bit of a presentation. Oh, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Ariel. Um, it's really good to be here. So my name is Ben. Um, I use he, him. Um, I'm currently based in the Chicago area. I used to live in Boston until, until recently. So I'm sending my heart out to all the Boston folks who might be on this call. I know at least one who might be. Um, and yeah, how to get into this. Wow. I mean, um, you know, like, you know, so my, so I work at, at, at Political Research Associates. We are a think tank that was formed in the 80s to help progressive movements um, understand and counter the, the right. Um, and, you know, for a long time in the 80s and 90s, Gary focused on the Christian right. And, you know, today we focus on white nationalism, you know, Christian nationalism, Islamophobia, um, anti-immigrant movements, um, and we, yeah, like I said, we basically are a group of researchers and analysts who help specifically uh, progressive movements to under, understand and counter the threats that we face. Um, you know, so as an American Jew, you know, obviously the fight against um, you know, anti-Semitism has always been very close to my heart. Uh, and like Ariel said, um, uh, you know, um, during the 2010s, as I graduated from college, I I became involved um and Israel-Palestine work, um, also really seeking a just, you know, peace in the Middle East, um, which, as we'll talk about, is very dear to all of our hearts in this exact moment, obviously. Um, and I, you know, so I, you know, I worked on college campuses helping student organizers uh, fight for palace you know, for Palestinian rights. And so we were right in the middle of these, you know, tense, fiery national debates around anti-Semitism. What, what is it? What is it not? How do we differentiate between anti-Semitism and, crit and criticism of Israel? Um, and at the same time, once Trump got elected, we were all faced with a new r rising w wave of, of right-wing anti-Semitism, authoritarian um, white Christian nationalism that is obviously still uh, very, very pressing in our country. So really with all of these things, you know, issues around um, anti-Semitism and how do we fight it, you know, with solidarity has always been very important to me and for a lot of American Jews and a lot of Americans who want to stand on the side of, uh, of peace and justice um, in our era. So I think we will, uh, before we get really into it and have you uh, give a presentation, Ben, um, we'll give a little overview of what's going on, because um, if it's tugging on your heartstrings the way that it is mine, um, it's been a very difficult week for you as well. So 11 days ago, um, there was a, a horrific massacre carried out by uh, militants from Gaza, uh, slaughtering uh, 13,000, 1,300, excuse me, 1,300 um, Israelis. And uh, in the wake of that, uh, the Israel Israeli government promised and uh, then made is making true on their promise uh, a brutal, brutal revenge. Uh, I believe as of uh, today, around 3,000 Palestinians have been killed over these last 11 days, though that number today may be much higher, um, including around um, over, over a thousand children. And uh, just today, uh, just 
about an hour and a half ago, a hospital in Gaza City, one of the largest hospitals in Gaza, uh, was hit. Um, the la- uh, I think I've heard at least 800 dead. Um, and this was a hospital both where the wounded were being treated and where um, civilians were sheltering, hoping uh, to find safety. And uh, there's some bickering back and forth, whether it was Israel that hit the hospital or an errant missile from Hamas. Um, but I don't think that much matters, honestly. I think what's what we're really looking at here, and I've heard very... Um, heard comparisons that I much agree with that uh, this is a genocide taking place and um, possibly a a second Nakba, a catastrophe when 750,000 Palestinians were ethnically cleansed from their homes and lands um, inside what is now Israel. And uh, one of the things that's taking place in Gaza right now is that Israel is demanding that those in the north uh, go to the south uh, for safety, though um, yesterday they bombed the south, Um, and trying to get Egypt to take them in, um, in uh, what could be a very mass expulsion. And Ben, I'll see what you have to to add to these uh, grim, updates yeah yeah thanks um ariel i think you laid it out uh, yeah you know pretty well and i'm sure many of us are probably glued to the unfolding catastrophe that is just um really feels unprecedented um you know uh, in, in many decades both for the like you know the sheer brutality of hamas's massacre against israeli civilians you know as a jew with a, a little bit of family in israel um I'm just like my heart is is torn apart um, by that um, every day, and on top of that, it, it, trying to hold the immeasurable you know grief of seeing um, seeing the the mass displacement and the mass bombardment, the collective punishment taking place in Gaza. I, 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 I think it's a really you know terrifying time, but I'm really heartened a little bit um, by all of the. By you know, like like yesterday, uh, for example, uh, you know, a large coalition of of, of over a thousand Jews and allies, you know, blocked entrances to the White House in D.C., demanding on President and Biden to to stop the genocide and um, so things like that have been really heartening. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a grim uh, grim time, and it makes the work that everyone on this call is doing so important. Thank you. So I want to encourage folks uh, to put any questions you have in the chat. And Ben, if you can give us, um, yeah, an overview of. Yeah, thanks, Ariel. So, you know, um, uh, you know, Ariel reached out to me to, you know, to give this talk um, about two and a half w- w- weeks ago, I think. And I, and it feels like a different world at this point. Uh, and at the time, um, I think you know Elon Musk, the the far right you know CEO of Twitter, um, among other things, was um, in the middle of launching an anti-Semitic campaign, um, you know, targeting the ADL. You know, obviously, you know, I have many criticisms of the ADL, as do many people on this call, I'm sure. But uh, but if not, but sorry, um, Elon Musk and. The far right were basically, you know, concocting um, a conspiracy theory that blamed the Jewish organization for for suppressing free speech on Twitter. Um, and what Elon Musk was was doing, um, and many of his white Christian nationalist you know, partners, was uh, he was tapping into a very old discourse of uh, of anti semitism that's on the rise. Um, in our political moment. So that's what, uh, you know, Ariel, I, I, you know, uh, that's what I was, I, I came here to talk about. It's what I focus on my work every day. So, so we are going to, to, you know, to talk now uh, uh, about the crisis of anti-Semitism that's rising, particularly on the far right um, in the U.S. But I also, will, will, you know, obviously um, what we just talked about is on everyone's mind and I want to weave that in and come back to it at the end. And then we can totally talk about this political moment that we're in with Israel as well. Um, 
But I want to give an overview now. You know, um, it's often hard for progressives to understand uh, what is um, anti-Semitism and how does it fit into you know you know all the other oppressions that that we're used to combating, right? Because um, it's the conviction of, of myself and, and many others that, that we really have to fight anti-Semitism and understand it um, in a way where it's connected to all the other forms. Of, uh, 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 of oppression um, and bigotry and dehumanization um, in our world. So, so you know, anti-Semitism is not, um, you know, isolated from these things. Um, it, it's a, it's a, the rise is um, in anti-Semitism that we've all seen um, in this country with the rise of Trump and the MAGA movement. Um, it didn't start there, right? It's always been you know, a deep part of American society um, and uh, and global society. But, you know, its rise um, in the age of Trumpism is part and parcel of a broader rise in nationalism, a broader rise in anti-democratic movements, a broader rise in anti-Blackness, um, Islamophobia, uh, anti-immigrant xenophobia. So that's the first uh, the thing I want to say is that that's the perspective that I take um, is to see them all as connected and to ask how, as progressives, can we fight anti-Semitism alongside all of the other issues that we're working on? So anti-Semitism has taken in many forms um, over the ages. I, I, you know, I, you know, its roots. Uh, many trace its roots. You know, ultimately to Christian Europe over over millennia, right? If you want, you know, I don't have time, obviously, to to give a lengthy, you know, historical deep dive. So anti-Semitism, you know, has thousands of years of history, right? Um, it really began um, in the beginnings of Christianity in Europe, when Christianity emerged as a Jewish movement originally, but essentially said the old said that Judaism was now an old religion that has been superseded, and that the new religion of Christianity is where you know the, the 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 truth is right you know jesus was a jew his first followers were jews but they have moved beyond judaism um, and now they said that you know the old covenant that god had with the jewish people is no longer active and over the centuries jews were the you know like one of the main others in christian europe right um you know you know, you know, as Christianity basically became, you know, allied with the imperial power of the Roman Empire um, in the fourth century, these these tropes and these motifs about Judaism evolved. Right? Jews were demonized um, as the killers of Jesus, which is a very old and, uh, and false canard. Jews were demonized as the embodiment of evil, right? Because you know, Jews were this uh, the uh, the uh, this community in Europe that was intimately tied to Christianity, but refused to accept you know the uh, the idea that that Jesus was the Messiah. So the existence of Jews really posed a big theological problem for Christians, and as Christianity became the dominant power, um, and you know through the Roman Empire spread around the world and around Europe. Jews were, were demonized um, as you know the enemies of of this community of, of faith. You know all kinds of tropes you know evolved. The Jews were were sinister, scheming. Jews were excluded from most professions, but only uh, allowed to partake in a few, like money lending. And then Jews were were scapegoated as in, sinful for engaging in money lending, even though Christians engage in it too. Uh, I, 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 you know, the association grew of Jews as allied with with greed and exploitation. And basically, Jews became a convenient scapegoat for peasants or for, for all kinds of groups in Europe who were upset with the dominant power structure, right? It was very easy for them, in, instead of really directing their anger at the feudal lords um, or those at the top of the caste system in Europe, they were encouraged to direct their anger at Jews instead. And this led over the centuries in Europe to periodic waves of expulsion, segregation, pogroms, forced conversion, uh, you know, other kinds of discrimination. You fast forward a bit, you know, obviously this is a very, very broad overview, right? Fast forward a bit to the, the modern era, right? The, the 1700s, the 1800s. 
You have all these new systems of capitalism, of all these new uh, global markets, you know, new, new, new governments, new systems of nation states, soon new, new, um, new media, newspapers, you know, movements like communism, social unrest, radical transformation of, uh, uh, of society and all the ways that people live together. And these old ideas about Judaism took on new form, right? Now the core idea you know, that animated um, anti-Semitism in the modern era was a conspiracy theory. And that's the form that we see a lot today, that this, this conspiracy that, the, that people whisper and repeat to each other, that a hidden cabal of Jews sits behind you know, all of the power st- structures, all of the phenomena of the modern world, Right, the Nazis and nationalist movements, um, fascist movements over a century ago said Jews were behind both capitalism and communism. Jews were behind the media. They said the Jews were behind the the government. Jews were behind, you know, um, racial justice movements. Jews were behind w- worker, uh, you, you know, unionizing. Right, essentially, mm-hmm. in nationalists and populists. Um, and fascists and reactionaries on the right found this to be a very convenient narrative that they could use to basically confuse people, to say, look the other way, right? Don't join movements for collective in liberation. Don't, you know, do, you know don't believe these union organizers, the, these peaceniks, these people advocating for racial justice. They're lying to you. What's really going on is that there's a Jewish cabal behind the scenes. Um, so this was used, like I said, by nationalists, by fascist movements. It was used to beat back movements for progressive change, like worker or a revolt, you know, communist and socialist and anarchist movements. In the U.S., these conspiracy theories fueled, fueled McCarthyism, right? You know, coming after labor unions and organizers, right? Because these, cons- these conspiracies are able to convince millions not to ally with progressives, but instead, you know, to, um, you know, to, to go chasing after uh, imaginary cabals, right? So it's no coincidence that these conspiracies spiked in times of crisis, like the Great Depression, right? You know, the rise of fascism followed after the Great Depression, right? That's when it really, really kicked off in Germany and elsewhere, because millions of people were, were frustrated and looking for a scapegoat, looking to understand what was going on and who to blame as the world got so challenging. And that's what we're seeing today too, right? Um, In our era of economic and political and many other kinds of crisis, uh, ecological, uh, you name it, the right is radicalizing. We're seeing a rise in authoritarian ethno-nationalist movements in the U.S. and around the world. And and anti-Semitism is a core ideological plank of these movements. Uh, these conspiracy theories are fueling attacks against Jews and against all communities, all marginalized groups, all social movements. And really, they're, f- they're fueling the rights the machine that's going against the very project of multiracial democracy itself. So for white nationalists on the right, the central conspiracy is that that Jews are basically behind everything they're they're afraid of, right? Because this is a time when movements for racial and gender justice are also, you know, growing. Movements for immigrant justice, you know, changing gender norms, movements for LGBTQ equality are are growing and are mounting real challenges to the status quo. And that's making those who have the most to benefit from that status quo, it's making them terrified, right? So, so white nationalists are spreading, spreading conspiracy theories that Jews are behind immigrant injustice, behind Black Lives Matter, behind changing gender norms in the media uh, and Hollywood. And we see these conspiracies um, echoed in dog whistle form all uh, across the establishment of the right. You, you hear GOP leaders scapegoating, you know, progressive, you know, Jewish philanthropist George Soros, for example, 
for for engineering immigrant caravans that they say are a threat to you know to western civilization right or they say that george soros is behind the black lives matter movement that uh, that big surprise in their eyes is a threat to western civilization right or they say that cultural marxists are this kind of shadowy cabal who are in uh, you know education the media you know who uh, uh, who are basically you know, moving, you know, trans acceptance, you know, LGBTQ acceptance uh, ma- mainstream. And they see that as, you guessed it, a threat to Western civilization, right? So these, they're using these conspiracy narratives basically to, you know, to make millions of people think that they're under threat and that the real threat is this shadowy figure, the shadowy cabal. They might call it George Soros. They might call it the globalists. They might call it the cultural, you know, you know Marxists. But the right uses this as this kind of you know, meta narrative that allows them to mobilize millions of people, not only to put Jews in danger, but also to attack in you know, a drag queen story hour uh, on the streets, to, uh, to attack Black Lives Matter uh, on the streets. You know, to go to the U.S.-Mexico border and harass immigrants, right? You know, you know, to vote for right-wing politicians, right? This is a really powerful narrative that the right is using time and again. And at the same time, you have the Christian nationalist movement, the largest, you know, you know, block that's furthering authoritarianism, right? Millions of evangelical and Pentecostal and uh, and charismatic you know, Christians who want to, you know, who are, are largely white, but not ex- exclusively white. And their goal, you know, led by Christian right wing leaders is to take full control of our state institutions and to reconfigure public policy and culture at every every level so, so that their vision of an exclusionary and ultra patriarchal you know, Christianity is the law of the land and this obviously is fueling attacks on trans rights attacks on reproductive justice attacks on bodily autonomy across the country and this is a threat to american jews as well it'll turn american jews and muslims and basically everyone who is in a a cis white christian right-wing male into second-class citizens in this country you know the the draconian abortion bans favored by the Christian right are, are against you know Jewish uh, Jewish religious law halacha, which doesn't hold by fetal personhood and more prioritizes the life of the birthing parent. Right, um, we're seeing Christian uh, in adoption agencies that that have received state funding that have denied services to LGBTQ folks. We've seen cases of these agencies you know, denying services to Jewish parents too, citing the same Christian nationalist laws that Christian nationalists are, 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 are introducing in state after state. We're seeing the Christian Zionist movement on the right, which is, you know, pretends to be Israel's best friend, you know, pretends you know, to be the best friends of the Jewish people, but really they're they're fomenting an agenda of permanent war and bloodshed in the Middle East because they subscribe to uh, an apocalyptic messianic worldview that leads them to support the far right Israeli government because they think that, you know, war in the Middle East means that Jesus will come back soon. And when Jesus comes back, then Jews, you know, all the Jews are going to have to be gathered up in Israel and and you know, you know, they're going to have to face a choice that Jews have faced at the hands of Christianity for centuries: the choice to convert or to be condemned to eternal hellfire. Right? So these, you know, so so people like Donald, you know, Donald Trump or Mike Pence um, or large large Christian Zionist you know, organizations like Christians United for Israel that have more members in that one organization. They claim ten million members. In Christians United for Israel, there are only seven million Jews in the U.S. Right, so this is really the largest block um, in the U.S. that is, you know, f- you know, furthering the U.S.'s you know support for endless Israeli occupation, furthering U.S. you know support 
for the dangerous agenda of Bibi Netanyahu um, and the right. And they say they're the, they're friends of Jews, but um, we need we need better friends essentially. <laughs> um, so you know that's a that's a two minute or maybe maybe fifteen minute overview of of anti semitism um, and the far right. Um, there's a lot more to say about anti semitism, um, especially uh, in the context of the recent Israel Hamas war. Um, and I want to have a lot of time for conversation, but I'll just say two quick things. You know, really quick. Um, Many of us across the Jewish left, you know, you know, as news spread of uh, uh, of Israeli civilians, you know, who were massacred by Hamas in the militants, many of us were, were, were deeply disturbed that many of our friends in progressive you know movements, many of our friends in the Palestine Solidarity movement, uh, didn't condemn Hamas's attacks of Israeli you know civilians. Um, they either. You know, the, they either sought to excuse it in various ways or worse, uh, you know, in a few cases, we even saw folks who, who were celebrating Hamas's you know, massacres as as resistance that that progressives should back. Um, and obviously, I don't need to tell an organization committed you know, to nonviolence that there's really nothing for progressives you know, to celebrate uh, about these massacres. Um so, you know, that was really hurtful. And we also have been horrified by Israel's genocidal war uh, on Gaza, right? We're looking at a horrific uptick uh, right now um, in the U.S. in Islamophobia, um, anti-Palestinian you know, bigotry. Um, uh, you know, where I live, you know, in the suburb of, of Deerfield, Illinois, um, there was a murder of a six-year-old Palestinian American boy. Uh, I think just two years, you know, sorry, two days ago, by by someone who was yelling, you know, all Muslims should die. Um, we're seeing, you know, calls, to, you know, to, you know, you know, to surveil Muslims and protesters that are reminiscent of the post 9 11 era. Um, and what Jewish progressives know. Uh, uh, and what we all know is that that nobody is safe unless we're all safe, right? Jews, Palestinians, everyone in America. So we're really praying and we're marching for an end to the bloodshed, an end to Israel's bombardment, um, and for these for these cycles of violence fueled by vengeance to stop. And you know, we need. You know, I also don't think you know, if, you know, um, Israel bombing Gaza and the smithereens helps fight anti-Semitism in any real way. So you know, part of the work of fighting anti-Semitism from a framework of collective you know, liberation means really envisioning a future and calling for a future where all Israelis, all Palestinians can survive and thrive and, uh, and calling for the relationships, you know, calling for American Jews and Muslims and progressive Christians and all groups you know, to really come together and demand a better world um, here and demand a better Middle East. Um, and yeah, so I'll stop there, but, um, I'm excited for our conversation. Great. Well, I'm going to start off and uh, encourage folks. I see some questions already in the chat, but continue to uh, place questions in the chat. Oh, I'm forgetting how to do double. Uh, let's see. Where did that go? Where I can get both of us on. Nope. Okay. Well, I'll get started anyway while I fiddle around with this. Um, yeah. So, you know, I was thinking a bit. The U.S. has, right, we're almost uh, more people of color than we are white folks in the U.S. And so I, you know, in this time, right, and with Muslims and immigrants and black folks and brown folks, um, wouldn't, why does the, like the far right still need Jews to go after, right? When there's these so many targets and many of us Jews and, and I identify as white um, and are largely assimilated and part of more part of the establishment. So what, how useful in what ways is anti-Semitism still useful in that conversation and how, prevalent is it i did see somebody put in the chat that they think it's actually a very small um percentage yeah i mean you know um i would say that um you know that um that 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 you know anti-semitism is 
I don't know, um, an important, you know, piece of kind of ideological you know, glue for the far right. Um, you know, they they need these conspiracies about George Soros, uh, you know, to basically name one big major enemy that they can put everything else, you know, under. Right? They will say that, you know, immigrants um, entering the border um, are are you know a problem but why are immigrants entering the border oh because george soros is there you know engineering you know in liberal um immigration policies or yes black lives matter protesters are flooding the streets why are, are they there you know because you know, george soros or global you know um, or globalists are are up there kind of in the hall of the power scheming to put them there because they want you know, control. So really, these conspiracy theories have always been a core part of right wing movements. It's just how they see the world. You know, if we think of it, you know, we, we have, have our analysis of what's going wrong with the world, right? And, and who's to blame, we could say the 1%, we could say you know, systems uh, of capitalism, I, 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 you know, I view um, you know, anti-Semitism as kind of a meta ex- explanation that the right, you know, they have their explanation, you know, also, and um, it's a part of their ideology, and it is a fueling attacks um, on Jews, and I think it's, you know, I don't, you know, I tend to think it's not helpful to play a kind of oppression Olympics where we think, well, who is more targeted than who in this or that moment, you know, all, you know, all groups. Um, are targeted by the you know the rising authoritarian right um, and and you know, anti-Semitism is deeply connected to these other oppressive you know ideologies and uh, you know, um, it's really important to fight it um, all together. It's also important to to recognize that white Jews also you know do you know benefit from systems of white 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 supremacy. Um, just like you know, white LGBTQ people benefit from systems of white white supremacy, um, and also are threatened and targeted by anti-LGBTQ bigotry, right? Uh, you know, there's plenty of room for us to consider like nuance um, and complexity um, in the way that we we understand, you know, how each of us, really every group in different different settings, might hold roles as you know oppressors and uh, uh, you know, um, and, and oppressed in different ways. So it's worth unpacking all that um, while also being sure, you know, not to minimize the threat of anti-Semitism that is very real um, in this country. Um, so yeah, that's what I have. A few thoughts. I'm going to go to a specific question because I think it's an important one and I want to hear your, your thoughts on it. <laughs> um, what about the left's, the left's anti-Semitism? And, and what about the left's anti-Semitic comments and actions? Is it only the right wing or is it both? And how does that how does that interact and play out? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um there definitely um, is anti-Semitism, yeah, yeah. you know, on the left, uh, in and the way that that I think of it, uh, it, it, you know, is you know, of course there's anti-Semitism, you know, in in progressive movements because you know anti-Semitism just like just like anti-blackness, just like you know you know harmful you know ideas about LGBTQ folks, it's part of the air that we breathe in, in um. Our, our society um, and progressive you know, movements are made up of human beings who who live in our society who we all you know, inherit harmful ways of of thinking and acting you know from living in a society that's structured you know you know by white supremacy and by all the systems of of oppression and so yeah people bring anti-semitism into left-wing spaces people bring anti-blackness into left-wing spaces um you know, and you know, some ways that I see it manifesting in left wing spaces are are conspiracy th- theories, right? You know, much like the right can have the kind of conspiracy theories I've I've been talking about. Um, on the left, you know, you might hear hear conspiracy theories that that the U.S. supports Israel because there's a cabal of Zionists who are in the U.S. government who are who are orchestrating 
orchestrating the media to be pro-Israel. That's that's a conspiracy theory. The U.S. supports you know Israel, and our media class supports Israel because it aligns with the U.S.'s imperialist interests. You know, like I think Noam Chomsky was the one who called Israel the the, the largest you know U.S. military base um, in the U.S. You know, for the U.S. Right. So the U.S. has its own interests. There's no cabal of Zionists up there who are making the U.S. support Israel. So that's one of the common ways um, I see it. And then there are also all kinds of you know, harmful assumptions about Jews and, and wealth, you know, Jews and greed, Jews and money, you know, all the kind of you know common um, anti-Semitic you know, tropes that you might face um, in society. You'll face them in progressive spaces, too, sometimes. Um you know, there are ways, there's uh, there's more I could say, but, you know, I'm someone who's organized for years for Palestine with solidarity. And I also think it's really important to say that um, it's not inherently anti-Semitic, you know, to, you know, you know to criticize uh, Israel. It's not inherently um, anti-Semitic, um, in my view, to, you know, to have nuanced critiques of the ideology of Zionism. You know, I do not identify as a Zionist, and I think it's not inherently anti-Semitic to say that you know, no state should be should be based off of, you know, ethno-religious principles for any people. Um, so we can criticize, you know, Zionism in a nuanced way that's not anti-Semitic. Um, you know, yeah, yeah. in my view, you know, supporting the boycott, divestment, and sanctions, you know, movement for Palestinian rights, you know, those tactics, that movement is not inherently um, anti-Semitic, you know, and like I said um, at the beginning, you know, or 20 minutes ago, um, I, you know, it was really disturbing, you know, to me a few days ago that, um, you know, I think our movements have a lot of work you know, to do to humanize um, Israeli Jews, so that we aren't, you know, excusing or condemning when there's the largest massacre of Jewish people since the Holocaust. Um, you know, I think it was really hard, you know, to see that a, that a good number of, of progressives really could not figure out the words to vocalize very simply that Hamas is a massacre of civilians was was horrific and inexcusable. Um, even as we can also point to the context, even as we can also point to the root causes of the conflict in Israel's ongoing oppression. So that's a little bit, there's more to say. Um, it's a very deep, very complex topic. And, you know, two Jews, three opinions, two human beings, a lot of opinions. But um, yeah, I, I, that's what I'll say for now. Yeah. So um, I recently finished Naomi Klein's new book, Doppelganger, which I highly recommend. I just loved it. And one of the things she really talks about in there is, so she spent a long time listening to, uh, to write the book to, um, why did I just forget his name? Uh, whatever. Uh, Steve Bannon. Listening to mm -hmm. Steve Bannon and you know, one of the things, and so I want to ask you about this, and it, it plays into the comments that I'm seeing, you know, that say they don't see much anti-Semitism or not much that's dangerous, um, is we don't see this as much, right? So we watch kind of, you know, we have mainstream media channels and mainstream uh, social media channels from X slash Twitter to Facebook, Um but I'll ask this as a question um, because I'm really curious your your position your your take on it. Is there sort of an additional movement going on that we're not aware of, and should we be aware of it? And what is your role in in tracking it? Yeah, so this is not conspiracy theory myself. Yeah, yeah, so. So what I think you're, you're asking is, you know, like, look, you know, I grew up in a liberal bubble. I grew up in the D.C. suburbs. Um, I grew up in a very diverse part of the country. Um, and, you know, you know, in my childhood, there were plenty of Jews in my, uh, in my very diverse you know, area. Um, and I felt, you know, safe as a white Jewish, uh, white Jewish person. Um, I, I felt I still feel relatively safe walking around in a lot of, uh, of parts of the country as a white as a white you know, Jewish person. Um, uh, I, you know, um, white Jews, Jews you know, as Jews are not you know pulled over by the police you know just for walking down the street. So obviously, anti-Semitism 
you know, like manifests differently than other kinds of oppression. Um, but what was really helpful to me was to talk to, you know, some, you know, talk to Jews who grew up in largely rural areas, who grew up where they were one of the only you know, Jewish people um, in their communities. And most of the people they knew were were Christians, right? And they were told that they killed Jesus in, in elementary school. They were told, you know, people threw a penny on the ground and told them to pick them up. Um, you know, they were... So, you know, anti-Semitism, um, you know, it can often, you know, for those of us who live in, in mostly liberal communities, maybe mostly in in uh, in cities, it can feel like it's not there, you know, sometimes. But it it's part of the the backdrop, the the foundational, you know, hum of this of this country, um, and you know, it can look different. You know, um, it doesn't always, you know, manifest as the daily you know grind of structural you know, poverty or mass incarceration um you know jews aren't being targeted as jews by the state um but it's a it's an ideology it's a, a discourse it's a way of thinking and understanding the the world um that yes does very much animate much of the discourse that you hear um, on conservative talk radio, right? It's not that Rush Limbaugh or Steve Bannon are going around saying the Jews are to blame, but, 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 but what they're saying is, you know, George Soros and the globalist cabal is, is to blame. And there's uh, there's tens of millions of people um, in this country who think uh, you know, in conspiracy terms. Um, and, you know, when you combine that with a triumphant, militarist you know form of christianity um that never works out well for jewish people or for any people uh, you know and it you know it took um anti-semitism yeah you know, many decades you know to circulate um you know across europe across european plight society uh, across european newspapers and discourse uh, 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 you know before the fascist era so i think uh, you know, it's really um, important to, you know, to remember that anti-Semitism is uh, as part of the world we live in, um, and the, uh, you know, not getting confused. You know, obviously, a lot of Jews, as Jews, are not uh, you know always in immediate you know, danger um, in these con- in this country. But as these tropes you know s- you know circulate um, and animate more and more uh, uh, more and more people, you know, it, uh, it, it's. S- it's you know spreading and so it's incumbent upon progressives and all people to uh, to understand them and to combat them so and i i think this might this this might be something that uh that that causes some of this confusion with people uh we see a lot of right now um say love of the jews on the right uh after elon musk um made his comments uh he was hosted by um ben shapiro who's a right-wing jew on and uh you know surrounded by he said look i i love jews and i love israel and after robert f kennedy um put out a anti-semitic and xenophobic conspiracy theory he followed that up with saying but I'm a huge supporter of Israel and a huge opponent of Iran. And we had um, Rabbi Shmuley, a far right figure, Jewish mm-hmm. figure, back him up. And so we see this often as well. And I I guess I'll ask you if it's increasing, but how does that yeah. interact with anti-Semitism? How does it confuse folks? Yeah. And how do we disentangle it? Yeah, yeah, I think it's a really good, you know, good question. Um, and I essentially think what's happening is that the right loves to use the image of Jews as basically a big leaf to, you know, to support its larger, you know, project of imperial domination, right? So the the right will say that you know Israel is the frontline defender. Of, of the U.S., you know, against the barbaric, you know, Middle East, right? You know, so they're positioning Jews in this special way, right? The the ruling elite in this country is largely white and Christian. This is a um, this is a you know, we live in a country that's that's structured by Christian hegemony. Um, 
but you know the these Christian nationalists, you know, movements use these talking these talking you know points of you know oh we love Israel or we love the, the Jews. You know, Donald Trump says, you know, I have the, you know, I don't have a single um, anti-Semitic you know, bone in my body. I have, I'm the least you know, anti-Semitic, anti-Semitic person you, you've ever met. Wow, he's at the same time saying, oh, by the way, George Soros is the the architect of the destruction of Western civilization, right? So they're they're using this this uh, frankly a fetishized you know image of of Jews. Um, you know that they're using you know the the around 25 you know percent of you know Jews um, in the U.S. who are right wing who strongly support the the right they're using this as kind of a a fig leaf to say oh we can't possibly be anti Semitic and as long as you're the right kind of Jew as long as you are a, you know a conservative Jew as long as you are you know um, you know believe in in the Christian you know, nationalist view on on abortion um, as long as you're anti LGBTQ as long as you support the the Israeli right we love you and we'll welcome you on the on the the stage and we'll we'll gladly uh, 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 you know, go after uh, abortion rights with you by our side right because you know then we can say we are a Judeo Christian project right we are judeo christian civilization right so they're they're using this you know there's a word uh, you know called philo-semitism right um which is a, a kind of a, a exaggerated love of jews right putting jews on a pedestal or some image some idea of the jew that you can use as as a talking point you know basically so you know i think that um the West has been doing this for about you know sixty or seventy years, you know, because basically uh, after the Holocaust, the U.S. and the West wanted to say we are the safe place for Jews, not the communists, not the Islamic fundamentalists. You know, we need to protect Jews. We, you know, and you know, and we need you know to get Jews on our side in the clash of civil civilizations against radical Islam or whatever you or, or what have you. Um, but this is, you know, ultimately, I think a kind of anti-Semitism um, in a way, because it's positioning Jews as this, you know, in the middle of these global conflicts in a way that I think won't end well for us. So, um, yeah, I, I, I'm really glad you asked that, and it's a really complicated thing to try to understand how the right, you know, can both use these anti-Semitic conspiracy theories and can say we're the best friends the Jewish people have ever had, but. Um, it's a balancing act that right-wing leaders are playing, but I don't think they'll be able to play it for very much longer. And I think it's it's a strange feature of our strange political moment, um, but it's also a very contingent yeah, feature in our political moment. So this is related, but uh, I believe it was... Uh, I believe it was Richard Spencer. There was a very infamous uh, statement that he made a a number of years back that uh, he saw Israel as the perfect example of a, uh, um, I forget the word, but the perfect example for the society that he was trying to build, that he would like to see America be for a white uh, Christian nationalist society and seeing Israel as that example. And if you can... um, both help explain what that is, why Israel is an example for white supremacists, and how prevalent is that? Um, is it just in like the Richard Spencer and the more marginalized for right, far right, or does it permeate um, along a line further. And then, uh, as I know, we're getting close to time. If you could also, because I know folks are really hungry to hear um, thoughts on on what we can do right now um, to stop the bloodshed. And um, yeah, whether it's voices we should be listening to, um, things we can do. Yeah. Yeah. What's even more horrific about what Richard Spencer said is that, you know, he, he called you know, his white nationalist movement uh, white Zionism, and he did it you know, on um, Israeli television, right? You know, Israeli Jewish anchors invited him to speak. It was after the the Unite the Right rally um, in Charlottesville. So Richard Spencer, you know, led a rally 
where white nationalists were chanting Jews will not replace us. And then he went on Israeli television, invited by Israeli anchors to say, you know, don't worry. I don't mean, you know, you, you guys. I mean, I mean these the subversive cabal of Jews in the West. But, you know, Israelis, you're doing something that I want to do for the U.S. I want a white, white ethno state. So, right. I mean, I think it's important to differentiate. Right. Many American Jews support Zionism. Not because they want to, you know, they they believe in ethnic ethnic, you know, cleansing or anything horrible, but because they see Israel as, you know, a safety um, in a hostile world, right? You know, Zionism can mean a lot of different things for a lot of different different Jewish people, and I think it's important for us to approach that with a kind of compassion, knowing that that you know, ultimately. Many Jews cling to uh, an idea uh, of Israel as the answer to anti-Semitism, right? After you know the Nazi genocide of a third of the world's Jewish people, you know Jews felt like they needed a state with arms, you know, you know, you know, to protect their safety. At the same time, I think it's pretty clear to us that the project of of political Zionism in the dominant w- ways it uh, it evolved ended up creating an. Ex- ex- Exclusivist, exclusivist ethno nationalist state that prioritized you know Jewish lives over Palestinian lives, uh, and I think that you know that political project ultimately uh, at the root of Israel's oppression of Palestinians, and so I think we need to imagine you know different forms of belonging in rather than nation states you know tied to any one religion or, or um, ethnicity but yes you know the radical right you know some people on the white nationalist right demonize you know israel with the same more conspiracy theories right but some on the radical right do kind of fetishize you know israel as a kind of you know you know ideal for them and the israeli right is out there you know forming these partnerships with with Viktor um, Orban in Hungary, with radical right parties um, in Germany, uh, you know, all over the all over the world, with Hindu nationalists in India, right? So, you know, so the Israeli right and its backers are part of the global far right, um, and you know, we have Bibi Netanyahu, you know, trafficking in George Soros conspiracy theories about his own own country, right? You know, so the political coordinates of our world are all upside down, but. Um, but basically, yeah, I think it's important to see the Israeli right and to see, you know, certain kinds of Zionism as forms of 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 of, of ethno nationalism that are very connected to to other kinds of white Christian nationalism that we see um, all over the world. Um, and so, what we can do right now, um, we can uh, you know, try to take care of ourselves. We can breathe. We can limit our social media consumption, which I know I need to. Um, and and like I said at the beginning, I'm really um, inspired by people who are taking the streets right now, right? People who are are blocking entrances you know, to the White House, you know, saying Jews say no genocide in Gaza. You know, uh, people who uh, are joining Palestine solidarity protests, even if we uh, think we might not agree with everything that's being said there, even if we feel, you know, as I do. I, 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 you know, highly ambivalent about you know, just, you know uh, about things we've heard. Um, I think it's important to have all voices out there right now in this exact moment saying no genocide in Gaza. Um, and I just, um, yeah, I think it's important you know to keep building building movements, you know, big enough and bold enough to, you know, to take on um, anti-Semitism and anti-Palestinian bigotry. And Islamophobia um, and racism all together, right? You know, to build the kind of broad um, intersectional coalitions that we need to to envision a better world um, in this dark time. And I think at times like this, this that kind of hope is really important. Thank you so much, and I want to thank everyone for joining. And I want to. Um, echo what you said, Ben, because I needed to hear it to take care of ourselves and to breathe in these um, challenging times. And I also want to say that I I really appreciated how you spoke about showing up at Palestine Solidarity 
protests, even in a time that it it may be difficult for us and um, where some of the language may be difficult or the, yeah, the messages, but um, we have to show up for each other and build this movement maybe the most when it's hardest. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's been really great to be with you all. Thanks for the work that ever, that all of you are doing. And I look forward to yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, to working together in all the ways that we can um, this time. Yeah.